You're listening to episode 336. Welcome to Transforming Missions podcast, providing you with insights and resources you need to lead a movement of Jesus followers. Tim, do you believe that your words reveal who you are as a person and as a leader? Well, you're starting deep today, aren't you? Well, maybe. Now, before you answer my question, let me say that our podcast today is to assist Christ-centered leaders in rising above the divisive rhetoric we hear in our culture today. Words are powerful. How we use our words influences the people around us. So today, we want to use our words to encourage you to become the best leader you can be in how you use your words to lead. Now, Tim, do you believe that your words reveal who you are as a person and as a leader? Well, Sarah, you ask a good question. My immediate answer is yes. Our words reveal who we are because as followers of Jesus, people about God's business in the world, our words and actions go together. And I say that it's not because I simply say something But do my actions match my words, and do my words match my actions? That's what makes the difference. So, yes, how is that for an answer? I believe my words reveal who I am as a person and as a leader. Now, you got me thinking here. I don't remember who wrote this, but I do remember reading these words because I wrote them down. (laughs) Of all deeds, words are the most revealing the most instantly available, and the most weighted with personal significance. When I think of that, the work of Christ-centered leaders is to bring word and action together so that the people in our communities experience what we say by what we do. Now, does that make sense? It sure does. I think I would call it integrity. If I'm not mistaken, integrity is built into the Hebrew character and worldview, so the context of our scriptures, beginning with the Hebrew scripture, is rooted in the reality that thought, word, and deed are considered to be one and the same. In Hebrew, word and deed come from the same word. So thought, word, and deed literally mean to say something is to do something. Your words and actions are integrated. They are one in the same. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe we have the opportunity to shape our churches, communities, and our culture with our words? Well, I think the short answer to that is yes. It's obvious that we live in a time when our culture is separated words and actions. Maybe it's not so obvious to everyone. It's obvious to me. I'll own that. Christ-centered leaders have the opportunity to shape culture by having their words and their actions go hand in hand. Yeah, one of the scriptures that helped me think through the use of my words comes from Ephesians. So let's try something. Would you help me offer some of the words from Paul's teaching with the church in Ephesus? Sure. Good, because it would be hard to have a one-sided conversation. (laughs) Let me give a little background. In the teaching, Paul's instructing new Jesus followers on how to live with one another and with people in the world. So his instruction involves putting away certain things and then beginning to act and relate in certain ways. So the ways of acting and relating are signs of the new life in Jesus. So the way they live reveals who they are. Now, Play along with me. Would you agree with that assessment? Yes. Okay. In Paul's teaching, what does he start with? Well, he starts with speech. So, yes, we're in Ephesians 4, the 25th verse, and we'll read several verses on. But in the 25th verse, so then putting away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with your neighbor. Paul starts with our speech. Then what does he say in verse 29? Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up 
as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. So Sarah, in four verses, he mentioned speech twice, with the last reference being very clear. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. Now, as a teenager, I learned that verse from the Good News Bible. I learned it as do not use harmful words, but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what's needed so that what you say will do good to those who hear you. So Paul is putting words in action together. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, he was a Jew, a Hebrew. He was who he was. His speech and action went together. There were two, there were two separate things, but one in the same. Now hold that thought, and we'll be right back after this short message. Have you ever watched a baseball game on television and discovered that the commentators confuse the game with their commentary? Sometimes the world is the same way. All the noise of those expressing their opinions is confusing. One way to focus upon the truth is to focus upon Jesus. Let all opinions be measured by His love and grace. And remember, no matter who you are or what you've done, you are loved. So Paul was a Jew, a Hebrew. It was who he was. His speech and action went together. They were two separate things, but one in the same. Am I saying back to you what you said before we had that little commercial break? <laughs> You've said it clearly, and I think Paul mentions speech again in in his teaching. What does he say in verse 31? Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. Another reference to speech. Words. But let me quickly add verses 31 through chapter 5, verse 2. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul puts words in action together, implying that we reveal who we are as God's children by being kind, tender-hearted, forgiving, and oh, by walking in love. Exactly. Our words are as much about being about God's business as our actions. Walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself up for us. Now, it seems to me that part of putting words and actions together is just being Christian. So let me be snarky and say, just be Christian. The bottom line is it's just being who God's created us to be and that being Christ-centered leaders is to assist others to be and do the same. That is all good. Now let's talk about how that impacts us as Christ-centered leaders. Your question to me was, do I believe we have the opportunity to shape our churches, communities, and our culture with our words? And I answer the question. (laughs) Now let me ask you this. What did you have in mind when you were asking me that question? Well, I was thinking of a couple of things, and one of them was how our words actually do shape our environment and our culture. Remembering a story from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I think anyone who knows Bonhoeffer's writings would say he used words to change the culture, especially in the prison he was in during World War II. The story is he'd walk the the corridors of the prison, he'd visit the cells, he'd speak to the prisoners. He was always offering encouragement, laughing and joking with them, uh, reminiscing with them, praying with them. His words were his primary means of ministry. But his words were also action. He wrote, God has put his word into our mouths in order that it may be communicated to others. The Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to her or to him. He needs that friend again 
and again and again. So, Sarah, yes, I believe we have the opportunity to shape our churches, communities, and our culture with our words, and Bonhoeffer is kind of an example of that. Now, I, another one might be a little funny, but I was also thinking of just small talk, ordinary conversation, how powerful it is that our conversations impact the lives of people around us. And I'm actually thinking of people who are hurting. For whatever reason, our small talk has the power to offer healing and hope. Every person you and I encounter, this is the way I think of it, every person you and I encounter have the same need for affirmation and encouragement. Some more than others, but our words make a difference in what we say and how we say them. So I sometimes think of it this way. I ask myself the question, especially as I reflect upon the day, at the end of the day, did anyone I encounter today leave me hurting more because I was more concerned about myself than I was about being a person of grace? Did they leave better off being with me? Or was I so self-centered that I couldn't be a person of grace? That I impart grace with my words? Sarah, I'm learning that talk is not cheap. Our words are powerful. Yeah, and I'm still thinking about Paul's teaching in our current climate of political name-calling and its impact on our society. What do we do to be the people God needs us to be at this time in history? Well, we've talked about this lots of times, and so I can think of one, and that's just keeping ourselves as Christ-centered leaders healthy. That's a good one. We keep, our, we keep ourselves healthy by staying focused on God. And being healthy helps us keep ourselves focused upon God's business, which is making sure our words and our actions are integrated. Yeah, and so when I think about health, I think about it in lots of different ways. There's, of course, our spiritual health. There's our, our emotional or mental health, our physical health, financial health, relational health, intellectual health, social health, and even occupational health. So which one of those <laughs> were you referring to when you said to keep ourselves healthy? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> but let me just take, and we mentioned this, I think, in our last episode or a recent episode. Let's just take physical health. If we don't keep ourselves physically healthy or emotionally healthy, we can get pretty weary with what we're asked to do. And what I've learned is if you don't get enough rest and you don't eat right and you're not taking care of your physical health, you can get weary, bone tired, weary of what you're doing. And then without thinking about it, you just want to do something else other than what you're doing. Yeah. I've also learned that, that you just don't get tired, that when you're tired, you, you respond differently, you react differently, so that if in, in terms of our words and rhetoric in the kind of political climate we're in today, if you're not healthy, you're going to say something sometime that you are going to say, I wish I hadn't said that. What I kind of laughed there as you were saying that, because what came to my mind was when, and I'll own this, when I get hangry, when I'm hungry, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I might be a little bit tired, that filter disappears be, in terms of, okay, how can this be said in a way that a conversation unfolds, and it's not said as an accusation, it's not said. It is not said as a judgment. It's not said to provoke someone. It's not said in a divisive way, but it's said in a way that, let's go back to the scripture, build somebody up. It's said in a way that is offered in grace that really opens up the conversation. And I, I, when I think about all of these different aspects of health, I think when any one of them are out of alignment, 
it impacts how you show up and how you are present to other people. And it impacts the relationships around you. When I, I can think of times, thank goodness, they were not long periods of times, but I can think of times in my life when it was, oh, when's payday? <laughs> and I've got a bill to pay. And the financial strain, that's running through the back of your head. Oh, you want to go out to lunch? Mm, nope, can't, because don't have the resources to be able to do that this month. And that is when there is not a balance there, and you might not even want to go out to lunch. So that's not a ju judgment about going out to lunch. I'm pointing to the financial health piece and what can filter into our relationships and our interactions when there is worry and stress on our health, whether it's financial, whether it's relational. Let's say you walk out the door and you just had a fight with your spouse. Healthy people know, okay, I've got the car ride between home and where I am going and the next person I encounter to get my head and my heart and my mouth in the right place. Unhealthy people <laughs> I don't have a word, just <laughs> grouse around the entire ride, whether it's a five minute ride or a 50 minute ride, and it gets taken out on the next person that they encounter. Here's the one that I think might be helpful for the question in terms of the question of politics in our country today and how that's getting communicated. The category of social health, how our actions impact our community, our society, our environment, I don't know that is one that we often stop and think about. I think that is one that in a highly individualistic society like the United States of America, that can get pushed aside, but it is absolutely not pushed aside when we think about the body of Christ and who we are as followers of Jesus. That is part of what we can offer to the world. That's the one place I was thinking as you were talking, that's the one place that we actually have an opportunity to make an impact. Yeah. Is in the culture, the society we're in, because we model a different way of responding with the kind of rhetoric and things that are going on. The difficulty I find in that, and this is where we talk about our healthiness and we're talking about our words, and the difficulty we find in that is that oftentimes we're willing to set those things aside because I have a right to say what I want to say. When you become a follower of Jesus, your filter is Jesus. Your filter is God's love. Yes, you have a right to say what you have to say. The love of God is greater than our Constitution. So I have a right to say something. But if I'm a follower of Jesus, I sometimes sacrifice my right to be right. And, and that's the social health. Yes. Because if we are considering and thinking about the goodness and welfare of the people around us. If we are thinking about how our actions, how our words in the context of our conversation today impact the community that we're a part of, impact the society as a whole, impact the environment that we're creating and cultivating, there are things that we're not going to say. There are things that we're going to say differently because we are a follower of Jesus. Because if you start with Jesus, and if you're a person of love and grace because of Jesus, those thoughts might run through your mind, but there's a filter before they come out of your mouth. Did you just say it matters where you start? <laughs> I did. I used a few more words to say it, though. I, it, but we're, we're in the right place here, and that is... Um, I, I, all the years, Sarah, that I've been through a pastor of a church and we'd go through self-denial services and people would go all that. Here's one place that this comes into play. 
is that we deny ourselves what we think we have a right to do so that we can be who God created us to be. And if we're actually offering a time of reflection, every day we have the opportunity to say, God, I repent of when I took your place in my life today. Reflection leads to transformation. <laughs> right. I, um, are, is there more that we want to say about that? Because I, I think focusing upon God's business is related to our, our practices. And we've not mentioned this episode, the practice of the means of grace. But if we're practicing the means of grace, it helps us keep, stay focused upon who we are in relationship to God. And I, may I just do this as something that I do every day, just to offer this? I don't know what this is, but I'm going to say yes, <laughs> given what we've just well, said. <laughs> let me offer this. So what would happen if we prayed every day? Oh, God, guide my thoughts, my speech, and my action so that what I think, say, and do brings glory to you and reveals your great gifts of faith, forgiveness, honesty, hope, love, loyalty, patience, peace, trust, obedience, vision, integrity, generosity, joy discipline, and self-control. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, and may the thoughts of my mind and the actions of my life bring glory to you. Now, Sarah, that's how I stay focused enough to model God's Word in everyday situations and circumstances. Does that make sense to you? It sure does. You just alluded to the most important word that shapes who we are and what we do. God's Word made flesh in Jesus. Well, that's who we are. We're the human touch of God's love in the places we live, work, and play. So our words reflect the Word made flesh in Jesus. So let me do my snarkiness here. If that's not enough to keep us focused, let me introduce you to God's love. His name's Jesus. There's nothing snark snarky about that. That's just saying it in a clear way. And you've heard us say before, clear is kind. <laughs> Thank you for listening. As a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode at transformingmission.org forward slash 336. So when you leave this podcast today. You're going into the mission field where people need a kind, caring, supportive, encouraging word. And God's already put that word in you through Jesus. The joy and peace of this life comes in sharing what you've received. So go in peace to experience the joy in the name of the living God who loves you in Jesus and who empowers you to be witnesses through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.